You're listening to the really useful podcast. This is the tech podcast for technophobes from makeuseof.com. Welcome to the show. My name is Christian Corley, and you join me in a week where it's just you and I. So there's no tech news this week and no recommendations. However, Ben Stegner and Gavin Phillips will be joining me in pre-recorded form in order to share some uh, interesting tips, tricks, explainers to help you make better use out of your technology. Later in this show, we will be discussing Twitter scams, VPNs, Wi-Fi types and some streaming services as well. There's a lot to get through. But before we get to that, a quick reminder that uh, this podcast can be shared far and wide on any of those places that you get podcasts from. So if there's anything that pops up that you're listening to, anything my mum could do with knowing a bit about this or my brother would help from understanding this a bit better, point them in the direction of this podcast or give them the link from the show notes that is uh, related to that uh, discussion and hopefully that will solve their little problem for them. Now, uh, ChatGPT and OpenAI have been used for various creative purposes over the um, past couple of years, largely, um, not not purely, but largely um, visual. Um, the text area of creativity has been a little bit more uh, slower to develop as um, I mean we've <laughs> this this whole sort of side conversation going on within um, the online publishing industry at the moment isn't it Gavin over uh, AI generated content which uh, we don't do it make use of have we used any AI generated images that have not been specified I don't think so there's a couple in articles um, that we you know that have been uh, specified clearly as AI generated because uh, <laughs> they came from a very sick mind but otherwise but there's another aspect to this as well. This is like actual creativity, um, fiction, comedy. In this case, uh, Make Yourselves Bob Sharp has been looking at whether ChatGPT can craft jokes. Gavin, I'm going to tell you a series of jokes. And I want you to tell me whether you think it was created by a robot, an AI, or a human, okay? You ready for this? Yeah. Yep, yeah, Okay. A snake walks into a bar. The barman says to it, how did you do that? Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm not sure. How, how should we do, do, do you want to answer it straight off? And then I'll give you the answers at the end. So it's, it's kind of uh, man or bot. Let's call it man or bot. Yeah, okay. Uh, we'll do it one on. We'll do it one at a time. Uh, so joke one. Uh, I think I think that one was an AI, surely. <laughs> <laughs> Do you really? <laughs> it wasn't. Uh, it was by person. Uh, <laughs> joke number two. A man walks into a bar with a piece of asphalt under his arm. He says to the bartender, I'll take a beer and one for the road. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, that one's got to be a human then, surely. <laughs> well, um... I hate to say this. <laughs> was that AI as well? <laughs> uh, that was human. Okay. <laughs> okay, joke number three. Knock, knock. Who's there? May 4th. May 4th who? May the 4th be with you. Oh, come on. I know. It's terrible, <laughs> That's got to be it? human, sure. Yes, of course it is, yeah. Joke four. Knock, knock. Who's there? Boo. Boo who? Don't cry. It's just a computer program making jokes. <laughs> That's got to be the AI. Yeah, I think so. Uh, it's giving num- itself up there. <laughs> it has, hasn't it? Number five. Joke number five. Why don't scientists trust atoms? Because they make up everything. Yeah, okay. Um, why don't scientists... That's got to be the AI, I reckon. You think? Yeah. Uh, apparently not. Uh, it's human. <laughs> I'm not doing very well here. 
<laughs> Hang on, let me just double check that. That was number five, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that's AI. Okay, uh, number six. I saw this advert in a window that said, television for sale, $1, volume stuck on full. I thought, I can't turn that down. <laughs> that's going to be human. I'm afraid it's, it is, yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. Joke seven. There are ten types of people in the world. Those that understand binary numbers and those that don't. Uh, I'll go for AI for that one. No, it was human. That seems... Human. Was it? Oh, it was God. human. It was human, yeah. And uh, joke eight. Why did the computer go to the doctor? Because it had a virus. That's got to be AI, that one. Yes, though, that one was AI. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, so good, good work, Bob Sharp, by pulling this together. And uh, you know, it's it. There's a lot more to this article than this. There's a whole, um, you know, the whole creative, creating um, comedy creation, comedy analysis, audience analysis, um, creating sketches, using generative language models to make people laugh. Is it a thing that will work or not? So, I recommend if you have any interest in comedy to check this out. I think it can probably at best he says um provide a good outline to maybe um scripting and you know, like creating first drafts and things like that jokes come from scenarios and situations which i don't think ai is ever going to fully be able to appreciate and given that we all have very different sense of humors and we have um cultural sense of humour, you know, the British sense of humour is very different to the US sense of humour. Just take a look at uh, Hugh Grant on the red carpet last week. I, I think that we were all laughing and the Americans were all, how rude! Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, there's a long way to go for AI uh, when it comes to comedy, but uh, certainly do check that guide out. Uh, Gavin, do you use a laptop? I do use a laptop. I've used many uh, laptops in my time as well. Um, I think the first laptop I had, or one that my uh, my dad brought home, I'm Ooh. fairly sure it was some sort of old Amstrad, maybe. Wow. Uh, maybe I may be misremembering it, but it was a hulking grey box, and I believe it ran... I can't even remember what operating system it ran. Um... But it was the first time I ever played uh, NetHack, the the uh, roguelike game. <laughs> wow! Uh, what what sort of year was this roughly? This must have been. Oh, I must have been about six years old, maybe seven. So calculate ready in the in the nineties. In the nineties, huh? all right. <laughs> in the nineties, yeah. I'm just uh, a young lad. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I um no I don't know exactly. I'm just trying to see if I can find it because I'd actually forgotten about it until you just mentioned um, Amstrad. We didn't have an Amstrad laptop, but my dad brought home a BT branded laptop. Aha! In the early '90s, I would say it was, and it was a hulking thing. It was some sort of um, had like a grey case. It was like the size of an electric typewriter, that sort of thing. And it was absolutely huge. Now I seem to recall I um I I disconnected the modem and tried to connect it to my Amiga which Amiga was it? My Amiga twelve hundred. And there was a burning smell, so I quickly disconnected it. Um that did that didn't go well. My Amiga twelve hundred no. should still be fine. Um I mean this is about twenty five years ago when I tried that hack. Um before that, my sister had a kind of um, my my. I was so jealous about this. My sister. I mean, I left college in nineteen ninety four. My sister started college in nineteen ninety five. I think she got a like a, and again, this may have been an Amstrad. A sort of a, not not a laptop as we know it now. More of like a Cyberdeck sort of a device with a keyboard and then a small LCD sort of um, four by eighty characters that she could do her homework on. Like a word processing device, basically. Um, and it, it was quite a nice and lightweight. And the battery lasted for like a fortnight or something. Now, the first PC that um, was released in uh, 1981, the first IBM PC, 
uh, you know, the, 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 the grounding of what we now know as a PC. But the first laptop predated that by six years. Although it wasn't really a laptop, it was merely a portable computer. The, um, the, the descriptor being, the qualifying descriptor being a computer that you can move from one desk to another. <laughs> <laughs> it was just okay. light enough, weighing 25 kilos, yeah. And that was the IBM um, 5100. Following that, in 19, uh, 1980, Epson released the HX20. This was a similar device to the one I've just described to you um, with an LCD display. Also had a, a, a mini cassette deck, uh, sorry, a big fan, a micro cassette deck, and a sort of a receipt printer style printer. And... It had rechargeable batteries that powered it for 50 hours, which is incredible for 1980, I think. Uh, in France, in 1980, 81, 80 was, there was a device called the R2E CCMC Portal, uh, which was released by Micro. And uh, this was another one that was light enough to move, but uh, not really what you'd call a laptop. Um, Following that, a year later, the Osborne 1 was released in the United States. This was a fully portable computer which resembled a suitcase. And there's a few of these uh, over the years. And what this is, you've got the, the keyboard flips off. And behind the keyboard, think of a suitcase. I'll describe this better. Think of a suitcase that you're holding by the handle. The bottom of the suitcase is the keyboard, which detect, uh, detaches, okay? You lay it down flat on the desk, the rest of the suitcase, and facing the keyboard are the disk drives and a small monitor. This was the Osborne 1. It's this, uh, a similar form factor was used on the SX64, which was a portable version of the Commodore 64 in uh, about 1983. Uh, there's the Grid Compass as well. This came along in 1982 after three years of development, working with NASA because they took this laptop, an actual thing that looks like what we now know as a laptop, into space. Unfortunately, it didn't have batteries. It ran on a standard AC power supply. Uh, <laughs> first, yeah. Um, Compaq released uh, its portable PC in 1983. Now, the interesting thing about this is this was it's 28 pounds, 13 kilos, so quite heavy. It closed like a suitcase, like the one I described earlier. But this was Compaq's first PC, first IBM compatible PC. So they didn't make a standard sort of um, IBM tower monitor. They built a portable PC. And the other interesting thing is, this was like the first big IBM compatible. This is the one that kind of... This is The release of this was sort of the beginning of the end for IBM's PCs. Because um, Compaq was the first company to reverse engineer the PC um, and, cr and uh, enable all this compatibility and stuff. And finally, we've got number seven, the TRS-80 Model 100, which is a Tandy Radio Shack device, which, again, it's like that type of cyber deck, uh, an eight-line, 40-character LCD sort of flat. Um, what amazes me about all of these is that, that laptops existed so far before I ever imagined and portable computers i mean to consider i was born in 1975 the ibm 5100 came out in 1975 it's incredible because that you know i look at popular culture in 1975 you know computers are the size of rooms with big open real cassette tapes open real tapes you know it's Crazy. mind blowing really isn't it the like you said it's the very fact as well they came before actual towers as well is, is what's blowing my mind i was like how could that even be the case with IBM? Wow. I'm going to interrupt the show as it is at the moment to uh, let you know that at makeuseof.com we have so many articles covering all different facets of technology. Now, in the Really Useful Podcast, we do tend to stick within the topics that we're largely comfortable with. So occasionally we might branch out, but, you know, there's topics, electric vehicles, smart home topics, um, Linux. We don't talk about that very much on the podcast or the Raspberry Pi either because they're kind of niche topics. We have so many articles on the Raspberry Pi and how to uh, get started using Linux computers as well. We've got an entire legion of articles on Mac OS and iPhone and Android and Windows pretty much any technological topic you can think of, we're dealing with it 
at makeuseof.com. So uh, take the really useful podcasters as sort of a flavour of what is available on the website. Follow the show note links and then just go exploring at www.makeuseof.com. <laughs> Now, I'm a big fan of using a VPN. It doesn't really matter whether you use it for watching Netflix or whether you watch it for yeah, use it for maybe uh, working from home purposes, or if you use a VPN for getting a better price on your flight. You should have one installed on your computer, um, a subscription with a VPN provider, and you should be using it pretty much all of the time, unless you're using a website which won't accept it, such as some banks won't accept connections over VPN. Uh, now, that said, VPNs have become a lot more affordable and available over the past few years, and they've become even more private, in fact, I would say. There's, I've had a look into this, and I've established 10 ways in which VPNs have become more private. Well, I'm going to give you a summary of them now, and then Ben's going to pick my brains about one of them. Okay? okay. So number one, logless servers have become a thing. Uh, there was a time when VPNs would just record everything, um, but that's not very private. And if a, a VPN is uh, recording everything, then they're subject to subpoenas and other uh, legal uh, requests that they have to adhere to. So uh, logless servers has become a thing. Uh, there is improved encryption now. Um, 128-bit AES has not been cracked in the real world. It may have been cracked in a lab, but it's it's not something that's uh, possible to crack uh, using uh, standard techniques. Even so, we, still, we now have 256-bit AES encryption, which, uh, mathematically speaking, will take longer to crack than the universe has been in existence. Which is insane. Um, diskless the will be in existence or has been Has so far? been so far, yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, diskless servers are a thing. So basically the servers don't have a hard drive. They just have RAM. The, the operating system boots over a network cable uh, from a remote, a, a, a secondary server and is retained in RAM. And th this means, you know, if, if the server goes down, all the information on it is gone. If a log requesting is, is made, the VPN company can switch off the server, all the information will be lost. You know, just like when you turn off your PC and the information that was in the RAM is lost. Uh, DNS leak protection. Uh, DNS leaks was a thing that happened a lot uh, in the old days, and IP address leaks. Um, we now have kill switches and other provisions which provide leak protection. Uh, basically, it means that if there's a leak, then when you connect to a VPN, uh, your data is been routed through a client app on your computer to a VPN server, and that data is encrypted. With DNS leak, information leaks out from the side, which isn't encrypted, and will give away your true location rather than the location that the server gives you. So that's a useful development. Um, private DNS enhances VPN privacy as well. And um, this means um, there's a thing called DNS, which is a sort of a telephone directory for the internet. So when you type in uh, www.makeuseof.com, that gets translated in a DNS to the IP address for Make Use Of. And that's how DNS works. Now, there's um, many public DNSs, and they're now private DNSs, uh, which are encrypted which is obviously makes things more private. Now, I mentioned the price of VPNs, and they're more affordable. Now, you might think, well, that's not that secure. But if you think about it, the price of VPNs has come down so much that everyone has the opportunity to be using a VPN, thereby everyone becomes more secure uh, online. Um, there's a thing called split tunneling as well, uh, which allows you to retain a com connection to your VPN while using apps that aren't using the VPN connection which is really useful. VPNs uh, allow access to overseas Netflix libraries, which I mean, you might say, well, that's not particularly private, but perhaps you're not supposed to watch the content that's on that Netflix library if you live in a particular country. So it's kind of, I'm stretching it. All right, I know. Um, <laughs> there's a thing called double VPN as well. So if you need extra encryption, um, you can connect to a VPN server, which will then chain your connection to a second VPN server which means there's two lots of 256 bit encryption taking place on your data and to enhance your privacy pretty much across the board you can install a vpn or set up a vpn subscription um 
on almost any device, whether it's a mobile phone, a smart TV, um, your router, pretty much anything. I mean, I'm not sure about fridges and smart kettles, but, you know, one day, maybe. So, yeah, those are the ways that I've established VPNs have uh, evolved over the past decade. I think it's really good. It's really important that everyone has a VPN. And to be honest, I think we're getting closer to the point where, at the very least, um, DNSs will be encrypted. If everything, everyone doesn't have a VPN, at least we'll have the advantage of encrypted DNS. Yeah, I think when I uh, when I moved and set up my own router and everything, I want to say... I forget which one I'm using. Uh, I think I'm using 1.1.1.1, which is, uh, let me see. What is it? it it's Cloudflare. Cloudflare yeah, DNS. I couldn't remember what it was. Yeah, um, that I heard was pretty solid. I figured I'd rather use that than go with Google's. Um, but yeah, that's another important step too. Um, so I get what my overall thought after uh, going through all that, I, wh where would you like to see uh vpns go in the future like what what features do you think they're still lacking or would be cool to add uh, that would make them more private and uh even a better a product than they already are i'm not really sure the problems with vpns now i think it might be with other devices specifically routers now there are some routers that you can get that you can install your own firmware on there and then you can configure a vpn connection f from whichever vpn that you're subscribed to similarly there are routers that you can buy that are all ready for you to set up your vpn connection with however uh, internet providers will ship you a router and you can't do pretty you can't do anything with it in terms of vpns i would like to see an end to those routers every router every user with a router should have the opportunity to set up a VPN on it. Yeah, like a right to install your own software yeah. on it kind of yeah, thing. Like absolutely. same thing with Android, where it was like, a you know, that they don't have like the bootloader locked permanently to where you can't install your own custom ROM on it or whatever. Um, yeah, I mean, it is crazy, like you said, that with them becoming more ubiquitous, it's funny, not funny, but interesting how VPNs went from, you know, eight or 10 years ago where it was like, something that only business people who were traveling used or just people had no idea what it was. And it became more of like a, an everyday thing. Now to where you're hearing VPN ads on t TV and podcasts and things like that. Um, not, my this worry podcast, is kind of that not this podcast though, not this podcast. No. Um, my worry is kind of that V like when I think about VPN overall, my worry with them is kind of, I think they've, they be, they become so ubiquitous that I think, it's almost sort of like security software, you know, how like we went from like security apps, like a vast being really solid and, and slim to just being like bloated and full of nonsense. Um, my worry with VPNs is that people think they're like, they're a one click, like you're totally anonymous forever, which yeah. these companies like to make it sound like, and it really isn't true. No. Um, so that's, that's my worry is that people think you're like, you know, totally erasing any trace of yourself like that's there's just way too many things that track you online for that to be practical oh yeah absolutely i mean like if you're going to uh, i mean if you're concerned about facebook uh using a vpn to then connect to facebook is absolutely pointless right because they already know who you are yeah, you're um, signing kit, in so kit boga who i think i've talked about before uh maybe a couple of years ago he does like scam baiting videos uh where he you know, oh yeah set up where he yeah, calls yeah. people who are tech support scammers and it's he's hilarious he does very elaborate things to them it's worth a watch um but he did a video not a not one of those videos on his youtube channel where he talked about like why vpns aren't the one click anonymity that they claim to be and went over many options you know he said if you're if you're somewhere eating with your friends and you take a picture and you upload it like that data has that photo has location data in it even if you're on a vpn like that's not gonna change anything and like if like if you use gmail like even though you're using a vpn there's still data in your gmail when you buy something like the the shipping address is in your email so like google doesn't think oh he just suddenly moved you know across the country or across the world like that there's other ways to show that yeah. you're not really where you know you're not suddenly in uh spain or whatever so yeah yeah, it's, I mean, it, it is useful for privacy in very specific situations and scenarios, which I've, I allude to in that article, and we've explained elsewhere on Make Use Of. Um, I, but you know, the best, the benefit that you're going to get from, from it is that, uh, and this is going back to the routers and the ISPs, they don't want you to have a VPN because they want to manage the traffic. Right. And they can't manage the traffic if they can't identify the traffic. It's called um, uh, traffic shaping. 
And if the traffic is encrypted, then they don't know what you're doing. So, which is why you get a better, why you can get a better internet speed from using a VPN because the traffic shaping is um, is isn't affecting you, basically. Um, but you know that's probably a conversation for another time. Big thanks to Gavin Phillips and Ben Stegner for joining me belatedly for this week's really useful podcast. Uh, we have links in the show notes which will help you uh, to track down the information that you that we're discussing and give you in more detail. And uh, you can follow the Really Useful Podcast hosts on Twitter. Those links will also be in the show notes. Everything we've discussed is recorded in the show notes. If you have a friend or relative that you think will benefit from anything we've discussed, share the podcast with them or share the show notes with them. We'll be back for another edition of the Really Useful Podcast next week. Take care, all the best, and until then, it's goodbye.